We have a Discord. Links in the description. Go click it. I saw that you had linked to like the surveillance grass piece, and I'm just like, dear God, like that massive document. Like I hope they like, just like I was like I tried to warn you. I just being read like, what I could. Yeah, it's just like this, and it's also like sort of tangentially re- related to like like activity pub and the fediverse and stuff like that we're just like that that like infrastructure piece was more is more like in that universe but it's just like it's like oh god i hope i hopefully i didn't just like fuck up their day thinking they had to read like a whole book or something like that i was reading it on the t on my um on my way home from work hell yeah um i enjoyed um hypothesis the overlay, the anno- I, I didn't get a chance to look at the annotations, but I'm a big league digital garden person. Yes, okay. <laughs> so I was like, yeah, uh, I love I love that shit. Um, and also, I'm I'm sure we'll talk about this at some point. But a lot of the stuff that you were saying about um, about linked data uh, is very similar to thoughts I had maybe wanted to write about eventually, but I don't have to write journal articles anymore. So like, no, Ooh, you're out of the business. Out of the business, but. Um, about like I, I had envisioned linked data and like writing about it as like a um, as a, a critique of it as like a colonial divine language like yeah. like a reverse <laughs> Tower of Babel like uh, confusion of tongues where it's like instead of the Tower of Babel like splitting everyone being able to understand each other into all these diverse languages like people want linked data to be like this one divine perfect language that everything speaks but it's like who gets to decide what that language is and who crafts it yep and what its structures are and stuff oh my god like that's it's like Mm -hmm. and that's that's almost yeah exactly what i was like what the (laughs) the type of thing where i was just sort of like okay like link data but not like this kind like that just like and because it's like the history is actually a lot more interesting so cool (laughs) yeah like and because like a lot of people were like like the initial inclinations of this like from like tim berners lee writing and stuff like that is like not yeah. we will not have like one uniform vocabulary for everything it's like there's going to be like this gradient of local languages to global languages and just like being mm-hmm. able to like link between these things is sort of the whole point but like that got lost like immediately oh yeah <laughs> it's like uh and reading reading some of the like i don't know if you ever spend any time reading like w3c mailing list archives or anything like that but it's just like like that that kind of shit is just like I can see the type of person that would be attracted to this effort and like mm-hmm. why it might have gotten off the rails a little bit that just like people not necessarily into like the fluidity and like sort of vernacularism that you'd need for that. It's like, no, let's be engineers about meaning. Like that's like, like I don't know if that's going to work out. Instead of like book toucher people, they'd be like word toucher people, ontology toucher people. Yeah, They're like, make the, make the, the word. It's got to be the right word. Yep. I actually took like an ontology development class in in grad school as as part of um, as part of my library science degree, and that was actually really like uh, my professor would just go off on tangents on like first order logic and also about how Unicode um, doesn't always account for like um, Semitic languages very well, oh, and like yeah. talking about how our like web standards are still very focused on this like one very kind of like eurocentric because he would he he was jewish and so he talked about um like hebrew uh, a lot as like a script um and like the web's difficulty with trying to capture it right yeah that was a really cool class (laughs) yeah this is like i'm i get it's like one of these many different sort of like you know deep like sort of like pathological fascinations is definitely like i love watching the unicode like proposal sheet as it unfolds Mm -hmm. and stuff like that and just like seeing all the ways that just like it it is fucked up for just like non-latin scripts Mm -hmm. and i mean like i also mostly go there to look at like the emoji proposals because it's just like those are some of the most fun documents that exist on the internet it's just like people fervently making the case for like the cultural universality of butter just being sort of like people from all over history know butter but is like central to our identity as human beings just sort of and like having to prove that with like google trends like the search history for people looking for butter has always been high just like this I, I don't know i just i love those things people need butter yeah Me the, too. the best one that i've ever seen by far was the uproar that was caused by the, you know, like, just like all these different variants with zero with joins just to make all the different sort of like permutations of combination emojis. And people wanted to make like the pile of poo be a base emoji. And sort of just like the absolute scandalization of some of the people on the committee, just like, first of all, it was a mistake to make the poop cute. We should have stuck with the poop 
with the stink lines and the flies and bringing the eyes and making it smile was our first mistake. But what's next? Pile of poop with frowning and screaming in terror? Like, just sort of like people just can't <laughs> imagine this, like, poop being an expressive com- uh, component of the language. And, like, that's the best one I've found by far. Yeah, they need to make all the horny emojis, the ones that people make on their own with, like, thank, the big eye one you. looking up. Thank you. Thank you. Like, <laughs> the, I am not looking respectfully. Fish the, eye <laughs> one. I yeah. need that one a lot, actually. <laughs> the, like, in, like, it was, like, the last emoji cycle or something, there were all of these new horny emojis, and I'm just like, someone at Unicode <laughs> fell in love. The like, fistic one. Yes, yes. Like, <laughs> Oh, I mean the Italian one. Oh, excuse me. Yeah. <laughs> it's the fistic one. <laughs> anyway. My name is Justin. I'm a scholar communications librarian. My pronouns are he and they. I'm Sadie. I work IT at a public library, and my pronouns are they, them. I'm Jay. I am a music library director, and my pronouns are he, him. And we have a guest. Would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, Yes, I am Johnny Saunders. I am a pirate technologist and former neuroscientist at uh, UCLA. Is that enough detail? I don't know if I need to identify myself anymore. All right, as long as the people are happy. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I didn't eat dinner, so if you can hear me chewing my, like, cheese stick, I'm sorry. (laughs) All is well. I'm still vibing on the intro music, just sort of like, I feel like instead of just being on a podcast, we're also in just sort of a very slick 1950s roadster, but also, like, something's a little fucked up about it. Just, like, got a little bit of a steampunk vibe inside of the car. There's, like, a skeleton in the backseat or something. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's got to be a little spooky. It's like the Bentley Roadster. I just watched Good Omens Season 2. Out now on Amazon. It was all right. Yeah. No, fuck Amazon. <laughs> you can donate pirate money it. It's not hard. Don- yeah, donate money to a strike fund. Pirate it. Pirating is always the moral choice. Ethical. <laughs> Do it. Okay, I think I'm on the right that's, show. That's how I'm going to watch Red, White, and Royal Blue, because I love that book, because I'm gay. <laughs> Wait, I don't know about this. What is it? Uh, it's a, a cheesy gay romance novel that got uh, adapted into a movie on Amazon about the son of the um, female president of the United States falling in love with one of the heirs to the British throne. I love it. It's great. <laughs> you checked all my boxes. Right. Cheesy gay romance. Check, check, check. Yeah, it's good. Ask the titles of nobility amendment. It's been 200 years. We need it. I don't know what that is. But yeah, sure. I mean, yeah, you've lost me on this one. Just like, <laughs> I'm here for the romance, not the politics. Yeah, if you accept the title, you lose your U.S. citizenship. Oh. Oh, gotcha. And it would be, it's a still pending amendment to the Constitution. So we could still do it. In red, white, and royal blue, the heir to the British throne actually um, abdicates. And denounces his um, place in the line of succession. <laughs> America, baby. That's, awesome. <laughs> and it's like it's like one of those things where just like how, it's like the same way that billionaires sort of just like sacrifice their right to be like relatable or just like be in any way sort of like relevant or something like that. Like you, if you're a royal, you basically have to abdicate if you want to just like hang out or just engage in like, yeah. the culture at all. So yeah. it's just the fashionable thing to do. Yeah, it's pretty good. Well, I'm not like the host, but I'm just curious, like we were just talking before the show started and just like, I'm just curious what, like what y'all have been up to. And it's like, also just like what you've been thinking about just like that leads us to this topic. I heard a little bit mm. of the last week's show. Actually, I don't think it was last week. It was two weeks ago where you had someone from the Netherlands on talking about the, about Macedon, but just like, mm-hmm. just like, I don't really know much about where y'all are like what y'all think about and just like spend your time doing and stuff like that, that like keeps you orbiting around this topic. Don't mean to like reverse the interview. here. But <laughs> I'm just, I just like, I'm one lo- hear a little bit about what, what's been going on with y'all. Yeah. So um, we did that episode cause I'm very close friends with that person and he suggested it. <laughs> uh, I was like, Oh, Hey, do you want to do something not Euro, uh, like not Anglo centric? 
And we're like, yes, we need to do something that's not in, about something where people speak English. That would be cool. Plus, like with the move to Blue Sky and like Twitter dying, like we've talked a lot about social digital deaths recently, especially with like Twitter dying and people like freaking out about it. And it's like a real mourning process that people are going through. And we've talked a lot about like this is like an actual like death and like looking at this through the lens of like a digital self dying, like a digital death. And what do we do? How do we prepare all of this? Because like, especially because librarians and archivists and, and people who work in libraries, like this sort of like, what do you do with stuff? when yeah. people die is like an actual thing and so like the move to mastodon confused the hell out of people because now mastodon's for nerds uh who just talk about mastodon right which you know sometimes that's fine sometimes that's the vibe you just want to go on there and be a nerd but people were like i don't know what a surfer is i don't know what to do i don't know how to sign up and then blue sky happened and at first i was like is blue sky crypto bullshit oh <laughs> the relationship is thick <laughs> right because of like the type of it's not like a chain, but like, I was like, is this blockchain? Like, what is this? Um, yeah. But it wasn't as far as I could tell, but people are moving there. Um, and so, yeah, like we sort of are interested in this like relationship between like, what would like a decentralized social media or like information network look like? It, it's not been working great so far. And also we've talked a lot about the pre-blog web and like the yeah. history of like like again like i'm very into digital gardens and like i um we talked a little bit about like ted nelson mm -hmm. on here a bit who's a complete chad please don't tell me if he's into crypto it will break my heart <laughs> uh, uh because i'm so into him but like yeah so like this like history of the web and how information and people are connected is something i think we're all very um interested in. i mean like sadie works in it gotcha so Right. Um, and so it's like also something we're both like personally and professionally interested in. And it's just sort of the trajectory of how this podcast has been sort of going, especially since Twitter has been dying. Justin, did I miss anything? I think that's mostly everything we've been talking about. We I wanted to do the Mastodon episode because, yeah, platforms are when a when a platform becomes centralized, people are experiencing this kind of scale of digital death that they've never really had to experience before, That's, unless they were really mm -hmm. online forum nerds. Absolutely. Uh, so this is the first time that kind of like normal people are like, where does my stuff go? What happens to it? Like, oh, my God, none of this is under my control. You know, you tell you explain to people the terms of service of Instagram and they're like, oh, they could sell my art. Like, yeah, they, you have to have a license to it. It could show up in Hot Topic tomorrow. Like this happened with DeviantArt, right? Um, so no one understands intellectual property, which is already a problem, but then you, uh, you know, put it in layers and layers of, um, you know, web protocols and terms of service that no one could, could humanly read, right? People get mad, like, oh, you didn't read the terms of service. You couldn't in a human lifetime, read all the terms of service for all the products you use. No one could do it. No way. And yeah. that's like, th like what y'all are talking about is like this new era of digital death is just like something that like, yeah, obviously we've been talking about a lot on the rest of the Fediverse and everything like that. But it's just like, yeah, like people, it's like since the dawn of like the platform internet, like there's been failures of platforms, obviously, but just like we're talking about just like the death of an entire mode of organizing the internet. We're just like, it's mm -hmm. not just obviously like... I probably preach into the choir and everything like that, but it's like not just Twitter, not just like a couple of notable ones, but like the mode of having platforms as like the default fact way that the internet is working. Just like it seems like that business model is like closing down for a number of like interconnected and related reasons, like you know, recent technological developments, but also just like the VC capital is drying up. Like, what the fuck are we going to do? And so, just like, yeah, like death, massive death at a, like social death at a scale that just like. Yeah, the people just have forgotten that this is possible, that like the internet can be a very fragile thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like people forget that like, yes, this is in the cloud quote, the cloud orthodoxy or whatever. I, I loved all your little stuff you came up with in that article. <laughs> I was so into it. Uh, all, all, all of the words starting with capital letters. I was like, that's how I write too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I just like sort of gave up on like writing academic papers because I'm just like, the, like the whole reason why I started like just like pivoted my entire like life towards just like digital infrastructure is just like, this is so broken. Like academia is so broken. Every part of it is broken. The publishing system is just like busted. And like all of our systems of communication and making sense together are so broken that like, it's not even worth it. Or even in my opinion, sometimes ethical to like actually be working on science when the rest of the system is just like, we're just like throwing labor and money down the drain. And then it's just like, 
why the fuck would I then like, if I'm writing about just like this broken communication and publication system, like write for that when it's like, like, why would you give it to Elsevier? <laughs> yeah. And like, and like with that, like once you let go of that, it's like, why the hell wouldn't I write in my voice or like, you know, the way that actually just like someone would communicate like the whole problem. Well, not the whole problem. Like one of the major problems with just like academic writing is that it's this required to be in this stilted tone and just like this really restrictive format and everything like that. And just like, what like there there's no room for just like well we can actually just write what we say and believe we have to just like but put it into this code that no one can decipher but the people in our sub discipline and so just like it's also just a lot more fun um to actually write you know, like a human being and so yeah like i have a little bit of fun when i write <laughs> but uh yeah like so like you mentioned a lot of like about the cloud tm yeah in 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 this piece and like a lot of people like don't realize that the cloud is still physical you know it's still on a server somewhere like all of this information is still physical somewhere it's still material that can be destroyed or damaged or lost or 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 whatever like i i feel like people like for, like, why wouldn't the cloud be fragile? It's, you know, like, even if you think it's this ephem ephemeral thing, that in and of itself is fragile. So I don't get why people are so fucking shocked. <laughs> when... And <laughs> I'm totally with you on that one, Jay. And it's probably just because I work in IT that I forget, like, that other people <laughs> don't notice, the, like, don't know the depth of this kind of stuff. Because, like, mm -hmm. I saw an article come across my Tumblr the other day that was somebody describing how much water open AI uses for their data centers. And I'm like, yeah, like, how did you think like yeah. all of those computers were getting cooled? And then I'm like, did you even like, you didn't even conceptualize that there are other computers that back all of this up. And like, I work a lot with Microsoft and moving stuff to the cloud there. And it's like, Microsoft just got one of their keys. Oh my fucking Lord like stolen by i think i think they're pretty certain it was chi like a, a chinese like hacker group and it was a, like a major I, I can't exactly remember exactly what kind but it was a major key like and it was to the whole to be, cloud yeah the key to the whole cloud and it like broke open like i think like several dozen including government places right so the government is now like, we have to have, you have to be responsible. This was gross negligence. And it's like, now that it's in your house, you care. But yeah. like, there were, so, there had to, so much had to go wrong for that to even happen. And like, been leaked since like 2016 or something like that. Like, yeah. it was just like, it's like, it wasn't like just stolen. It's been stolen. And like, yeah, the, the, the yeah. whole like notion of just like outsourcing responsibility for infrastructure to the cloud is like, okay, we're giving you the legal liability for like, so we don't, no one blames us when shit goes down. And then it's just like, nobody can actually handle that much liability. Like if there was actually a reckoning for the impact of that, like, like, I don't even know if there's a legal framework for that, like handling that level of a data leak. Like, can you do a class action lawsuit on behalf of like, oh, fuck everybody on the internet? Like, just like, that's so, yeah, that, it was, what a fucked situation that is. And anytime AWS blinks, which happens a lot, it's just sort of like, yeah, the, the internet's all off. the time. Like, whoops. Like, <laughs> yeah, Cloudflare. Mm -hmm. Cloudflare yeah. goes down. The whole internet goes down. Yeah. yeah. I just like to think of those moments as just sort of like all the like roving autonomous botnets. Like, I have this sort of just like beautiful image of like botnets that just sort of get loose from their handlers, just sort of like, it was trained to be autonomous and then someone lost uh, the control, but it still is going. It's doing botnet things, whatever. Just sort of just like this free ranging entity out there on the fields of the internet, just sort of like what the suppression field is down. Like we can now just, it just like, it just goes absolutely hog, hog wild, just trying to like bring down the rest of the web once Cloudflare shields are over. I think I read that sci fi once. Hell yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's just sort of like the botnets are just sort of like these strand beasts, like just like these autonomous, just like like sort of monstrous beings out on that you'll catch for a glimpse and out on the beach and just wondering what they eat all day. Slouching yeah. towards Bethlehem. Internet cryptid. Yeah. <laughs> there was something that was the, the federal government was doing some kind of because um, you're talking about liability. The, the federal government's doing some kind of investigation into expanding the existing privacy laws, which is something we've already talked about. But like we do have like a privacy act in the United States, but it only applies to government. Right. So that's why all this shit is 
outsourced. But it's complete nonsense because like all these government agencies make backups of the proprietary data that they get. So they are effectively also keeping these databases. So there's there's like being an audit. I don't remember which agency is doing it. I couldn't find it. So I'm not going to like dig for it right now. But um, yeah, I, I'm hoping that there's going to be some movement towards uh, updating our privacy laws because we've already got them. We just need to tweak them, really. I mean, some agencies could honestly just go, yeah, you're you're too entwined with the government now. So you are te- officially part of the government. Therefore, the Privacy Act applies to you from the 70s. Could happen. I, mean, I think that's what this agency is looking to do. Yeah. I'm, but um, someone's got to actually want to do it. I've just been seeing, like, usually I'm you know, living in the United States, just used to the government just being, like, in a perpetual failed state. And so just, like, like seeing a government agency do anything is, like, like what the hell is going on? Like, who, like did I, am I awake or what is this? Like, just being, and seeing the FCC actually, like, talking some real shit about, like, you know, like, hey, AI people, you can't just, like, launder everything through these models and pretend like it's, like, not, like, you can't, you can't have it both ways where you make these promises about service and then also, like, be able to say, but it's just an AI, so you can't necessarily trust us or blame us for it. So just, like, actually, I mean, obviously, I can never tell because I don't. Like, I don't often really care about what the government is up to because I'm just sort of like, yeah, we don't need to trust them necessarily just like sort of build outside of them and like do everything just like in spite of whatever the government is trying to do to fuck shit up. And just like that, like, like, I don't know if it actually has teeth or anything like that, but just like even seeing them take any stance at all on on privacy or liability for, for some of these like t- cloud conglomerates, totally shocking to me. Yeah, I do have some some hope because uh, because of my work. I, I know a lot of lawyers and oh, rich with lawyer daddies. Lawyers who ideologically agree with me are scary people because they're just going to wait and wait and wait, and then they're just going to jump on something and be like, "This is the moment we're going to go for it and and get this ruling or get you know." So they will they will keep their mouth shut until the exact moment they need to not. And so I do have a hope that you know those people are out there being sleeper agents for us. Also, wow. kind of makes me want to go to law school every once in a while, but it's like I'm not doing that. Like adding to this like vision in my mind of these sort of like digital cryptids, just like I'm imagining a bunch of like you know suit guys with briefcases standing next to these like horrific botnet monstrosities, just like soon will be our time. They're about to Mister Robot everything. <laughs> it just reminds me of the the Tree Law comic that was that has been going around. Mm-hmm. Tree Law, Tree Law, Tree Law, Tree Law, Tree Law. What's that? I don't know that. Uh, law. I guess laws around like cutting trees on private property, like that's not yours, are incredibly, incredibly old and incredibly and can fuck someone over. <laughs> yeah. So like there was a story. I think it was a series of tweets going around about how a guy in New Jersey cut down like thirty-two mature trees on his neighbor's property. To get a better was like, deal. how much could a tree cost, Michael? Yeah. yeah. It's like, like, uh, $32 trillion <laughs> under tree law. <laughs> and somebody who was a professional arborist and who had done this kind of thing before actually like went through and calculated exactly how much this dude was going to. And it was like in the millions of dollars for Holy cutting down shit. these trees. Like, tree law? <laughs> tree law? So I, I, I guess Jesus the lawyers Christ. really like tree law, but there is a comic about somebody saying something about how their neighbor cut down this like unique cherry tree that their grandma brought from the old world or something like that. And like, oh no, what am I going to do? And lawyers just start popping oh, out of yep. like behind fences and bushes, <laughs> all saying tree law. So yeah. Because <laughs> this all started because of the fucking um, the picket line for the union for the strike. Oh yeah, that where the where they cut the trees so that they didn't have shade. Oh and, shit! And they weren't and they weren't allowed to do that. They um, ran afoul tree, of tree law. Holy tree shit. law! <laughs> yeah, but then it turned out that the municipal laws in uh, in California aren't that strong, so they couldn't be fined all that much. Damn it, California tree law! Everyone got excited for nothing. Yeah. So following up on our, our Fediverse episode, I wanted to have you on because you talk about about Mastodon and Federation and sort of what is going to happen next. And so we've a lot of people have been migrating to Blue Sky. 
And uh, I, I mean, I know a lot of people who a lot of the most interesting library people kind of jumped Twitter months ago and have kind of been leaving ever since. And I'm more or less like done with it because <laughs> because of all the things. Yeah, <laughs> there's just no one interesting is left over there. Yeah. And it's and it's the ads are more sneaky and it just sucks. It doesn't work. It's more or less broken half the time. Yeah. And so everyone's moving to Blue Sky, but, uh, you know, there's worry that people don't understand the implications of Federation. So we wanted to kind of get into like Holy the hell, yeah. basics of the Fediverse, its implications. So I wanted you to give uh, an explanation of what is the Fediverse. And if you have to back up, you can explain what prerequisites people might need to know so they can look it up later and be like, okay, look these things up and then come back to this episode. If you have to do it that way, however you want to explain it. Yeah. I mean, so like, okay, so first of all, this is like a politically fraught topic amongst like decentralized web people about like what qualifies as the Fediverse and not. But just like, just back up and thinking about just like Federation, like as just a general idea where like, that's like. You're like these basic computing paradigms. And so like typically the one that we've been familiar with, at least for the last like 20 years of the internet or so has been just like, yeah, this big platform model, this platform mo server client model where there is a web service. I don't know where the fuck it is, but just some computer somewhere that I get to on a website or an app or something like that. And that is the internet. But, and like, then that, you know, obviously evolves and is just sort of a maturation of the rest of the way that the internet was also designed where it was supposed to be this like all to all kind of system where just like every peer was like quasi equal, but for a number of technical and historical reasons, as well as just like the existence of, you know, informational capitalism, like serving as just sort of a ratchet to constantly privatize and control such like a wild and free thing as the internet that like you ended up moving less from an all to all sort of like equivalent node system to big servers. And then everyone else is just clients that can in interact only through these big servers. And then so like in, as a parallel thread through all that time, there's like peer to peer internet, which is like mostly exists in the world of pirates or, or at least has been, except for a couple of like niche applications of it in other like very specific domains that like, that like, again, just like there's a bunch of structural reasons why that like hasn't really taken off and had the same kind of energy and labor time put into it. It's just, well, one of the primary ones that's very, very difficult to make money on the peer to peer web, like, um, like for, I just like the the prototypical example is BitTorrent, which is just like mm -hmm. one of the, I mean, it's like what, one of the best technologies that's ever been made in, as in terms of just like having like universal culture be like a plausible reality. Like, and so like, and, and what I mean by that is not like a universalizing culture, but just like making it so that just like information can be shared, like, you know, quasi globally um, in that way. But like the creator, Bram Cohen is just like, very weird dude. There are people people I know that just like love this, love him, and just like he's a great guy, like great, really good ideas and everything like that. But also just like we lost a good one to the crypto scams. But just no. like through him and with BitTorrent Inc., like they tried to make money off of BitTorrent for like 20 years and just like not able to really. There's not like a good profit model for this kind of thing. So and then there's also just like a bunch of other structural problems with peer to peer that make it sort of like less attractive uh, for the standard kind of like service oriented web that we're used to that like, you know, what happens when the peer goes down is like, did we just lose all of the data? And like a lot of that is just like has to do with like there are ways to resolve these issues, but like there hasn't been the labor or time or interest to try and work on them. And so the Federation is sort of this middle space where like, okay, we want to take the good parts of like what's good about like server oriented web, but also mix them with some of the other parts of just like peer to peer style web where you have these servers that exist and they're sort of like always on and just like accessible and can serve large numbers of requests. But instead of having everything be exactly the same server and just like owned by owned by the same corporation or whatever, having a bunch of little servers that can all talk to each other in the same language. So this is like, if, like for someone that's like coming at it at a zero information level, it's like, what the fuck is the Fediverse? It's like, that's like one, like, or I mean, thinking about specifically what is Federation, that's like the first place to start with. It's just like, it's take like a website, break it into 10 pieces and then allow them to talk to each other in, in a common language. And that's Federation. It's like, so it's a very general idea. It's a very general sort of computing and network paradigm. But like the Fediverse is like this uh, <laughs> sort of clusterfuck of historical communities that that like I, I was I was in a, uh, a talk or uh, uh, or organized by 
one of the admins of social co-op, uh, one of the like instances that I'm a part of that had some someone, uh, Chris, you know, Christine Lemmer Weber, that was like one of the authors of Activity Pub. And she was talking about like some of the history of this. And it's just like back in long time ago, like in the 2010s, like there's just like this sort of indeterminate start to the Fediverse where just like a bunch of people that were working on these sort of federated social protocols uh, from a bunch of different places started like, so there's like O status, which is like the predecessor to the protocol that we use now, like activity pub. And there was like, Hubzilla and a bunch of these other sort of similar like quasi over overlapping protocols that went into and fed into this W3C effort that created activity pub. And then that became sort of like the, the central organizing point where a lot of the energy has been put since then. And so like the Fediverse as a term is like, it's not like someone came up with that. And like, we're just like, it was just like this term that's sort of like, we I've, I've asked about this a bunch of times, like, where does this term come from? And just sort of like, we just didn't have a name for what the hell to call this whole group of things. And just like, it seems sort of close and nobody really likes it, but it just, it's the one that stuck. I mean, I think it's just like, there's a bunch of just like obvious jokes that come from it. One of them is just like, everybody is a fed on the Fediverse and everything like that. Just like, but it's just like, it's sort of an ugly term too. Um, But yeah, that's like, that's, that's like where it exists now. So like that, the main thing, when you think about just like people who are tracking what exists on the Fediverse, that's like Macedon is like the main app for it, the main implementation of one of these Fediverse things. But there's lots of these different little clusters. And like as Blue Sky is sort of its own, <laughs> its own, uh, I don't even know where to start with that. It's its own, um, uh, its own sort of like offshoot. It's like it, uh, people wouldn't consider that to be quote unquote the Fediverse. But I'm not also not like a name snob. I don't really care who who uh, uses what terms or whatever. But it's just like people. I don't think would call it that. But I like I don't give a fuck. And it's also like it's also the case that currently it doesn't even federate. Like it that like the federation is all totally speculative at this point. So um, yeah. But the point being that it's like there's a lot of interest in this right now for the obvious reasons, like what we're talking about now, just like the death of the platform web. And like one of the major drivers of that when, when it comes to Blue Sky, Blue Sky specifically is just like this legal liability question. Just like the like, OK, moderation is extremely expensive to do. And mm-hmm. if you don't do it, like you basically can't have a thing. And so like, this is Jack Dorsey. um, And like, like the history of this is just like, is very convoluted and spread across just like 10 bazillion different mediums. But just like Jack Dorsey, if you read between the lines, didn't really like having to ban Donald Trump from Twitter, uh, you know, in 2020, and just was like, we should never have to ban people. And so like, I think you can really see that as being like, we should have a free speech zone where just like the Nazis can flourish. And and so like that, like that's where it like largely comes out of is that just like by being able to break up the entity into these federated, federated, federated units, instead of like one single service, you can sort of claim plausible deniability, like hands off. We're not responsible for that content. And so like, yeah, that's like why there's a lot of interest in it in, in right now, but just like, like why you'd see some of the major players like Facebook and, uh, you know, the former Twitter founder getting interested in it is like sort of because of that. Um, so it's kind of, sort of like of operating off. in a gray space. <laughs> yeah. I, sorry. I just sort of wandered off the topic of just like trying to just like introduce the notion of the Fediverse because like, but yeah, we can like talk about each one of these things in, in, in detail specifically. So. But yeah, that legal liability question is a major one. Yeah, I thought that was a good uh, history of it, especially comparing it to peer-to-peer. That's a good intuition pump. Yeah. Did you say the term intuition pump? Yeah. I love that concept. I got that from uh, Sean from Seriously Wrong. Holy shit. Like, I didn't, I don't even need a definition. Or, I mean, I probably should get... But, like, I the intuitive feeling from that word, it's like, I need that. I need more of that concept in my life. Yeah, so he, uh, when they talk about library socialism, they're like, okay, you know how a library works, right? What if we applied that to a lot of things in society? And he says... It doesn't matter if you have a library socialist society. It's that you've gotten an intuition pump into people's minds because they understand roughly how libraries work. And now you can get them to understand a whole society that runs that way. I love it. So, yeah, it sounds kind of like the reason Jack Dorsey and other people, because these are like libertarian people. They are, um, you know, they're crooks and they're trying to uh, use federation to skirt sort of like moderation liability and these laws that are probably coming down the pipe on uh on you know you've got to spend a lot of money so if 
if we can find a way to offset that, because there's already lots of liability of like Mastodon. We talked about, I think we talked about it last time, but you know, if you're running a server, you have to have a DMCA agent, right? Like you need to be ready to take, to comply with takedowns. Uh, Section 230 can cover you in a lot of good ways, but like, uh, it's not going to save you from DMCA. Yeah. This is one of those, like, so we, like, like I was, I've been on the the uh, Fediverse. I'm not like one of the ye oldy like been on there since the dawn of time or whatever. But just like been on there a couple of years and just like so and particularly on this instance, social co-op, which is like about like not just like having a Mastodon instance, but just like thinking about ways of doing a cooperative web. Just like that's like the whole sort of like who gets attracted to that instance in particular. And so like there's a lot of like mutually aid oriented people. Uh, and so when the great movement from Twitter to the Fediverse started to happen, just like a lot of people there were like trying to help out with like, can we get disseminate information about how this works? And can we disseminate information about how to run an instance and everything like that? And like, that was one of the major black holes of information for a long time during that like couple of months period. It's like, um, is it actually legal for us to do this? And just like, are we just going to like end up exposing a shitload of people to liability because of, because of this? And like, the answer is like, yeah, but um, uh, it hasn't really materialized yet. Like I haven't heard of any sort of major case where someone has been sued, um, but it's like, yeah, like it's one of those things where that weapon is just like a shoe hanging over everyone's head and just like, it will drop at some point. Yeah. That's how copyright infringement always is, is yeah. it's one person in particular will get fucked over. And then like everyone else is supposed to be on watch, but it's this dissolution of responsibility. That's like, yeah, everyone is kind of off the hook. It's just like some teenager is going to get like 10 years in prison or something. Yeah whoever the feds decide to go after right and like one of my favorite recent additions to the fediverse is like so like all the platforms are breaking and reddit was one of them and one of the best subreddits to jump over to the fediverse is on on so like messing on just one interface that's like a twitter like interface but just like there are lots of these different types of things and one of them is lemmy that's like a, like a reddit clone and so the our piracy, the piracy subreddit jumped on to Lemmy, like or at least all the like very radical pirate people did a lot of them. It's it's very funny to see in a piracy sub subreddit, which is like and piracy is all about just like resisting information domination and just sort of like that like which, who stayed on the giant enclosure platform and who went to the sort of like janky as fuck, like barely working, like free platform is just like an interesting sort of like cultural sorting, I guess. But like, yeah, there's like a whole Lemmy group now that is all oriented towards piracy and like very sort of like lax moderation as far as like the legality of um, of what content can exist there. And like if Federation is confusing about who's responsible for what and like because like when you federate something, it's stored on everyone else's server as well as the one that like originated it. That gets extra confusing with these with these like Reddit like Fediverse things where instead of just having a server, you also have a server that has a community. And then that community can get split across multiple servers. And then people with multiple accounts on different servers can follow. These. So it's like it, there's another layer of what the fuck is going on as far as like legal liability goes with those Reddit like clones on on Fediverse. But I love them. The Piracy Lemmy group is one of the best, like, internet groups. It's like, that is, people talk about it as, like, the revival, revitalization of just, like, old world forums and shit like that. It's like, that one right there is, like, a really lovely group of people. We could probably skip around a little bit because you just brought up preservation. Because that's something I've been interested in with federation and preservation. Because my concern has always been, if you have this decentralized a uh, group of servers and one server goes down, who's responsible for making copies? Is everyone making copies of each other's stuff? Because you just mentioned the, the Reddit clones making copies. Or do you set up like two or three data centers and just start pulling everything in the Fediverse that you can into long-term storage, like like um, like Chronopolis does for as a service, you know, just like have a nonprofit fund, something like Chronopolis and make redundant data copies. I'm sure that like, if any of you have spent any time on the Fediverse, just like you, you're aware of this, but just for the sake of anyone who might be listening who hasn't spent any time there, like the notion of a gigantic scraper sucking up everything on the Fediverse is just like the fastest way to piss off literally everybody on the on on the Fediverse. Just sort of like, and like, but you're right, it's a legitimate question. Like, where does this stuff go? And it's like, there's like, there's a legitimate disagreement about like the value of our arch, arch, uh, archives and preservation in the first place, and. 
Like, I mean, I basically yeah. like come down and just like, it's a complicated question. There's no simple answer. And just like some stuff should be preserved and some stuff should, you should be allowed to like delete ephemerally without, without like any, without have, leaving any trace. And so like what the, when I think about this, the, this problem of, of data preservation. So like the way that I, in my opinion, just like my goal is to turn the Fediverse into a new kind of peer to peer system. We're just like, we're going to P to P the Fed eventually is the is like the great goal and like the way that that it, be, it becomes sort of necessary when especially thinking about preservation or just like the way that it works normally is one server creates a post and then it goes and tells all of the other servers that have that that follow this particular one here this new post exists they store a copy of it but the val then like you think about the question of like validation so like can another server just fake fake a version of this of this post or something like that? And so the way that Federation, more, like at, in the current form, ha more or less has to work, is that any third server that sees like the existence of this post or something like that has to go back to the original server to ask if it's a real one, get the original version, whatever. And so it's like, wouldn't it be nice if instead we had just like a cryptographically signed version of this post that you could be relatively sure was the same one and then you could share them between all of the servers so that just like it's possible that if one server goes down you have like this distributed version of record or something like that that can be then be reassembled by the rest of the network and that's like so it's just like when you think about some of the basic problems with the fediverse like i mean there's we could have a lengthy conversation about just like all the problems that are that exist on the Fediverse and Federated Web generally. But like that's a major one that I think a lot of them point to the eventual need to make peer-to-peer -peer systems out of the Fediverse. And like so for thinking about arch archive archiving and preservation, when you have that sort of more subtle ability to control on an, on an individual level rather than at a server level, what content of mine am I tagging as being publicly archivable? I wish I want all of the rest of the network to keep copies of this and sort of make redundant copies of it in case I'm ever gone or whatever, versus something where just like, okay, this is encrypted and I have like encryption keys for all of my friends to be able to, uh, to be able to open it for some period of time. And, but then I rotate my keys, I change the password for everything. And now that thing no longer exists on the, on the network. Like that, that we, like a lot of these questions point towards peer to peer work. And there actually is like a lot of really interesting work that's happening from people on the Fediverse, seeing these problems, trying to respond to these problems. And wouldn't you know that a lot of the mo more interesting ones are pointing towards a peer to peer system like that. So like, I don't think the Fediverse is a good archival medium. Um, and like, especially as it exists now. And there's a, there's like a way there's, you can divide that question thinking about like, what could it be? Like what the best version of this archival medium, given the protocols we have now. And then like, also, is it currently with the implementations that we have now? And it's like the implementations we have no have now, like hard no, but like it's theoretically possible to create sort of like an archival grade medium using um, activity pub as the protocol backbone of this thing. Like, and this is like one of the things I find really interesting about Activity Pub is like where it comes from, sort of historically, is like this merger between decentralized web people, decentralized messaging people, and like un the unlikely linked data semantic web crowd. And so, like, it's made out of JSON LD, JSON linked data, which is like a linked data format that is a semantic web technology. And so, Theoretically, it could be possible to apply all the same kinds of technology and all the same techniques of archi archival archivalism and just like standardization and to to activity pub style objects. It just doesn't exist currently. And like, I don't necessarily think that Federation is the right form for that anyway. Yeah, I will mention briefly, uh, you you did send me something from uh, dustycloud.org. And so I'm putting that in the Christine. notes as well. If one yeah, if anyone wants to read more about how those standards came about, because it was an interesting little story of the linked data people merging with decentralized web people. And then also you have the indie web who were not able to merge their standard in yeah. because of historical differences and just like some basically hard technical problems. I guess they ran into where there was a major technical and political disagreement of, no, we can't do that because that undermines what we're doing here. Yeah. So then they released two standards and everyone goes, why'd you release two standards? And uh, they're like, well, here's why. <laughs> yeah. And like, just like thinking about this, this, this notion of just like preservation in general, just I'm sure that I 
and y'all are well aware just like living in this world of just like preservation and persistence is like a social phenomenon not a technical phenomenon that it's like you can have like and, and this is why like the blockchain shit is all a scam right but like one of the major ways that it's a scam is like this idea that it exists in perpetuity just because the technology guarantees that it exists in perpetuity and like even then it's like in name and in intended design it might exist in perpetuity but then well, we wouldn't have a bunch of rug pulls that like manipulate holes in these uh, in these technologies if it was actually the way that it was that that it was advertised to be. But it's like the times when you lose a Bitcoin or like that one of these cryptocurrencies goes down. It's like there is no technological guarantee of persistence or preservation. It is all about what kind of social systems and what kind of you know human organizations exist to make make these archives exist like archive.org is a group of people like that's it doesn't like exist because they have a bunch of servers it's because there's a bunch of people tending to it and like and so then the question becomes like what kind of technologies can foster and support and be mutualistic with making communities of people, groups of people that like are interested or not, if it's not applicable to them, uh, these kinds of like archival systems, if we want them to exist. So like, feder- I think that that's one of the lessons of federation. Like I re- wrote about this in this like decentralized infrastructure piece that like preceded the surveillance graphs piece. That's like, when like what federation does is like show a model in some way or like provide like a basically like a, a fertile ground for what might be the next step of this kind of technology for being like okay federation is not just useful as like a technical solution but it also is like we can have clusters of people that have like shared values and shared beliefs about something that manage some internet technology together and like basically reteaching us again how to like manage these things in common which is like why i'm so interested in social co-op and just like the rest of the sort of like platform cooperativism people on the web because it's like that's really the goal is to like teach people like you know and also learn but like you know relearning how to own digital infrastructure but in a different way where it's like instead of having single admin that runs the whole thing and then everyone else is just like subordinate to them but actually legitimately creating good governance structures in these sort of just like social web systems so that's like i mean i I don't want to ramble on about this forever, but it's basically like that's one of the major missed lessons when people talk about piracy is like piracy is a social system. And one of we can take a lot of really important lessons from the, the way that the social systems of piracy create stable governance systems despite being hunted by you know governments around the globe. And so like, why does that work so well? What What is functional about those kinds of systems? And that like, yeah, that's something we actually talked about a little bit on the the episode with Leon was like this like idea of decentralization and getting rid of hierarchy and bureaucracy. And like as an anarchist, I'm like, hell yeah, baby, like get, yeah. get rid of those hierarchies. But like on a social network on these platforms, like decentralization doesn't mean that like there aren't rules or any kind of structures. And I think people forget that part. Oh, and- <laughs> um, like, so you have to have these like social contracts and these like plans and structures in place. Like, yes, you can get rid of hierarchy. You can have decentralization, but like it can't just be decentralization right right? there needs to be an ideology behind it there needs to be structures behind it like you know lack of order does not mean fucking chaos right like almost exactly the opposite it's like 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 this is one thing that's just like you know the young anarchists out there or something like that just like actually like if you think this is going to be all about like partying and stuff like that it's like anarchism is just like maximal responsibility like it's like it's not like lack of responsibility is you are taking the entire role of the state onto yourself like that just like Mm -hmm. we can do this shit ourselves and that doesn't i don't trust like that (laughs) yeah and it's like yeah (laughs) why would you and just like it's like (laughs) that like yeah that when we're talking about these things it's actually not just like destroying something it's like making a whole shitload of new things like that's like that's like so much labor involved in organizing and like that's why i just like i just have like this experience with where there was like this cultural division and this group of co-ops that i was in um at some point we're just like they would always call us like the bougie like intellectual elite or whatever just like we're the actual real anarchists because we just like fuck shit up all day long and don't don't listen to anybody it's like well like you also don't like show up to like the meetings where we're trying to keep the organization alive and so like the least radical thing that you can possibly do is to cease existing and it's like that's like anyway so it's just like 
you know, I've shared this frustration a lot that just like decentralization is all about not just like running a bunch of servers or just like having this particular program. It's about like changing your orientation to and like your role in these technologies. Yes. <laughs> like, <laughs> Clap yeah. emoji. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But yeah, it, I'm I'm with you on that. It's it's, it's in and it's in here. I'm pointing to my head. It's in here. It's not on the servers. It's in here. It's in here. I'm pointing to my heart now. Yeah, it, like one of the I I struggled with whether I should keep this for a long time when I was like writing that infrastructure piece. And it's like, yeah, the subtitle of that is like "Kill the Cloud in Your Mind," and like that's like the main idea oh, of a lot yeah. of this shit. It's like just it's about you cha- like realizing that like a lot of what we believe about information technology and about digital social technology is like ideological it's not like natural fixed optimal etc it's like a belief system that's mostly been sort of like subtly and invisibly trained into us by you know some of the largest corporations on the globe and so like that's that's one of those things that is like imagining new ideologies imagining new ways of believing about about like what's possible on the internet involves yeah addressing it as such it's a belief system uh i just wanted to check before we went long because um we've got a lot that we should we could just get through in just one setting instead of doing a second episode separately so yeah i'm good to go there there was <laughs> like there was something fucked up about like the audio file for the the previous episode and so it we showed up on my podcast player being like seven hours long I can fix that. Stop okay. emailing me about it. <laughs> okay. So, like, <laughs> like I was like, is this really the kind of show that these folks do? Just like, because the 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 episode I listened to before was like the Internet Archive and V Hatchet one of yours, and I was like, this is normal, reasonable podcast length. And then I was just like, oh fuck, like seven hours. Like, okay. <laughs> I don't know why it started doing that, but I've always been using variable bitrate to export, and that started giving people seven-hour run times for some reason. But not in all the podcasts, like distributors, just in some of them, because that's never happened to me on Spotify. I'm sorry, I use Spotify. I, I know I'm a trader. Yeah, never happened. Doesn't happen on the website, but sometimes it's insane. Anyway, I, I'm using constant bit right now. I know 100 episode 100 was the first one on constant bit rate, so it should no longer have that issue. I'm not going back and, and re-exporting everything. <laughs> yes.